Hi, Kevin. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing fine. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Kevin Scott, the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Microsoft. And boy, do I have some tech support questions for you, Kevin. <laughs> Does that... Do, do people make that joke all the time? Uh, they, they they do, and it's okay. Although I, I think I might be the worst tech support person in human history. Well, we'll find out right now, won't we? <laughs> we will. Um, um, so, no, actually, what we're going to talk about is your book, Reprogramming the American Dream, whose subtitle is From Rural America to Silicon Valley, Making AI Serve Us All. Um so we're going to talk about AI, whether it's good news for humankind or bad news. You say it can be good news if we play our uh, cards right. Um, yes. But before we get into AI, I want to talk a little about your background, um, because the book is very much set in the context of your own kind of social and cultural background. Uh, the uh, There's a, a, a preface to the book written by uh, J.D. Vance, famously the author of Hillbilly Elegy, and I think you feel you have something in common with him culturally by virtue of your background, which, which uh, makes your story uh, all the more interesting and, you know, makes your testimony relevant to the question of what the implications for AR, AI are going to be for people. Uh, you know, parts of America that might not think they're going to benefit from it and uh, and might think they should worry about it. Uh, so why don't, why don't you tell us a little about your, uh, your, your... Great. So I grew up in rural central Virginia in the 70s and 80s in this little town called Gladys in Campbell County. Uh, it is a farming community um the the major industries there when i was a kid were tobacco farming uh textile manufacturing and furniture manufacturing and you know the interesting thing economically that happened in that part of virginia over the course of my childhood is most of that industry went away um you know my and my dad was lucky enough to be in the construction industry. So like he, he had, you know, more or less consistent work through my entire childhood, but like you could sort of watch the community around us, uh, like really dramatically change in character, uh, as the jobs from these industries went away. And, you know, the, the force that was changing the nature of those jobs was globalization mostly and with tobacco a, a lot of it was with regulation so um, you know like we just discovered that that was an unsafe product and people's consumption habits mm -hmm. changed probably for the better uh like uh, definitely for the better so um, automa automation wasn't playing a big role in the in the decline at that point no it was uh, it was mostly i think um Mostly, I think, uh, globalization. So, like, mm -hmm. the jobs in the textile manufacturing plants and the furniture manufacturing plants were just migrating to right. other parts of the world where labor was cheaper. Okay. And, you know, it, it's sort of interesting. I write in the, in the book, uh, like, the, the book was, uh, a, a interesting, uh, opportunity for me to go back and revisit this community. So I, I, you know, my, my mom and brother and aunts and uncles and cousins and my grandmother still live in the same place that they've lived their entire lives. And I visit them frequently, but I hadn't really talked to people about their work there or sort of looked at what the economy looks like in, in that part of Virginia in a while. And, and, you know, the book gave me an opportunity to go look at that critically. And, you know, the interesting thing is where the jobs are resurgent there automation is actually playing a positive role so the more automation that these businesses are able to use the more globally competitive they become and so you go <laughs> from zero jobs to some jobs uh but because you're using the automation it's not the hundreds of jobs uh that you had before but it's a smaller number of higher paying jobs uh and like there are more of these small companies and so that's a very interesting pattern i think um yeah but but sort of back to my uh back to my upbringing i i you know my dad was a construction worker his dad was a construction worker uh 
you know, his grandfather was a construction worker. Um, my, um, my maternal grandfather started off his life as, uh, as a farmer after he got out of, uh, out of the Navy in World War II. Uh, he had a farming accident, uh, that made farming hard to do. Um, and, uh, he, he lost his hand in a, in an accident. And so, uh, he, uh, became an appliance repairman. He had his own little business, a shop in this very Th- quaint little downtown where he fixed things for people. Doesn't seem like the ideal job for someone who's, who lost his hand, but, uh, he made it work, I guess. He, he did. And it was sort of extraordinary. I mean, like, this is a total tangent, but my grandfather, like, you, you just had no sense whatsoever that he was, uh, impaired in any way like what he could do with one hand was more than what people could do even if they'd had three Mm -hmm. uh it it was just really extraordinary how handy he was and and you know a lot of uh, go ahead well i was gonna just say he got you interested in engineering in a sense right he he absolutely did so my my dad uh my dad and and both of my grandfathers were always working on something they were always making something or fixing something and and my uh my my maternal grandfather uh, shorty like in particular was always taking things apart and reassembling them and recombining things and making little gadgets uh and i i just found everything that he did fascinating and his uh his workshop was fascinating you know in fact the thing that you can't see is like right over my monitor right now. I have, uh, I have two old Stanley, uh, number four hand planes hanging up on my wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, one from my grandpa Scott and one from my grandpa Tibbs, uh, that both of them used in their work. And like, I, I just find it incredibly inspiring to think about the tools that they use to do the creative things that they did, uh, you know, back in the, in the forties and fifties. Okay. So you got, so you, you translated your interest in figuring out how things work and making them work better, taking them apart, putting them back together into the realm of computers. You, you went to, so you went to a magnet school in high school, I guess, and that I, gave you some opportunities computer wise. And then you went to a small, small college, uh, wound up getting a, what, a, a PhD from UVA. Um, I, I was, I was in the PhD program at UVA. I dropped out at the, at the last minute to go take a job at Google, uh, much to okay. my PhD advisor's chagrin. <laughs> but, but, but not regrettably, it sounds like, uh, whatever yeah, you I, might. I, 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 I used to regret it, uh, but I, I don't anymore. And I don't think my advisor does anymore. He's still one of my very good friends. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, it was just, uh, it, it, you know, in a sense, like I, I didn't feel like I had a choice. I was, uh, like I, my father passed away. I was taking care of my mom and my brother. I met my, uh, my, you know, future wife, uh, like right as we were at the end of, uh, you know, the end of our PhD studies. And I just didn't know anymore how I was going to make it financially work. Uh, like I was some, some period of time away from graduating and my financial situation was just increasingly dire and I just felt like I needed to go get a job. And like mm-hmm. part of that is, you know, may- maybe I didn't, but like that was my ethos. Like when your financial situation was hard, like the, you know, the thing that we always did that my family always did is like go hunt for work, uh, like whatever work you can find. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I left academia, uh, just shy of finishing my PhD. I had, uh, had most of a dissertation written and, uh, uh, like the lie that I told myself is I was going to go take this job at Google and then I was going to write the last few chapters and schedule my defense. And I got there and got so preoccupied and was having such a good time that, uh, that never happened. And I guess at this point, uh, the dissertation would no longer be on the cutting edge of knowledge if you went back and finished it. Is that, is that right? It most assuredly would not 20 years, uh, uh, later. Okay. Well, maybe they'll give you an honorary degree. <laughs> yeah. They, I, I, do, I do not need that. I'm, I'm perfectly, okay. uh, perfectly content. <laughs> okay. So, uh, good time to, to, to join Google. Um, you, you, uh, you got in the ad business, uh, in, in Google, which is, uh, I guess Google's main business. Um, and that right away, uh, 
got you into AI? I mean, maybe you'd, you'd, you'd been in it before in some sense, but but maybe we should we stop and talk about what exactly we mean by AI. Uh, what what range of things um, constitutes artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, it, the the term artificial intelligence itself has been around since the mid fifties. Uh, there were a group of mathematicians and computer scientists who got together in the summer of 1955 at a workshop at Dartmouth. And, you know, they were thinking about the cybernetics movement and information theory. And, and they, they tried to think about a framing for, uh, like this bundle of work that had been happening since the advent of computing, uh, earlier in the, in the century and uh like they came up with this notion of artificial intelligence and it was a very expansive definition that they had um like they they were literally trying to produce a set of software systems that had the the general cognitive power of uh, of a human mind mm-hmm. uh, and part of that was like i think them wanting to better understand what a human mind was and how it functioned and part of it was just this you know general curiosity about you know could could we reconstruct this thing and like what could you do with it if you had it um the the flavors of ai that i have practiced uh have mostly been this sub discipline of ai called machine learning where you are trying to teach a computer how to accomplish a very specific task by training it on a large volume of data uh mm-hmm. where where in the data like tells you something about the solution of the the particular problem or the you know how to accomplish the task uh you know like I and you you are right the very first machine learning system that I built was uh for the ad systems at Google um and like we we had a very very specific task that we were trying to accomplish with this machine learning system that I built which was you had human beings reviewing the ads that were coming into the into the system to try to make sure that they adhered to our editorial and content guidelines and so you had very smart human beings all day long looking at this torrent of ads to make sure that they didn't have repeated punctuation or that they were capitalizing things correctly or that, uh, you know, like they weren't using superlatives in an appropriate context. And those are all simple things. And then they had the complicated things like, um, is this an ad for adult content? Because mm-hmm. ads for adult content could only be run on searches where the user had switched off safe search. Uh, and like those ads couldn't be syndicated to certain partners uh, because of the contracts that we had with them. Now, were and these so all things, were these all text or were there images being they, processed as well? They were uh like the 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 initial system only handled text. So mm-hmm. it was uh like you you basically had uh like the thing that you see in a classic Google text ad. So a title and two lines of text and there was a link uh mm-hmm. to a landing page, a URL. And so you looked at the keywords that the ad was bidding on, you looked at the at the the creative which was that little chunk of text and then you looked at uh the landing page and mm-hmm. like you analyzed all of those things together to see whether it not it adhered to the content policies that we mm-hmm. had and so like it was a very narrow task it was sort of complicated because there the reason you needed machine learning is because it would have been too difficult to write out all of the rules in meticulous detail about what was or wasn't a content violation. So what you did is you, you, you had a whole bunch of examples of things that were content violations and you had a human being say, this is out. And like maybe you would sort of say like why it's out. Uh, and like you would have a bunch of you know, things that were in and like maybe the human, you know, who was doing the rating said why it's in. And then you trained a machine learning system to try to discern the pattern in the data that was, you know, good versus bad. Uh, and then you use that system to mark things good or bad uh, that no one had ever seen before. So there were some rules articulated by the people. Uh, I mean, you can imagine a case where you just don't do that at all. You just say, uh, so, you know, you, you mentioned in your book, uh, a program for detecting spam email, I think, and maybe yep. one you worked on. Um, so you can imagine, 
uh, just saying to the computer, look, here's the ones we've classified as spam. Here's the ones that are okay. Have at it. You yep. figure out the rule. But but it sounds Correct. like in this case, there were some cues given the computer uh, about rules, or did I get that wrong? Yeah, there there were, there were some rules. Uh, uh-huh. So like the, you know, the, the things like no superlatives or no repeated punctuation, like those were hard coded rules, but the content things like there weren't rules. Like you just, mm-hmm. you, you basically had exactly what you just said. Some examples of things that you wanted to be out and like examples of things that you wanted to be in and you like let the machine learning system figure out what the rules ought to be, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. Now, I assume you would give it, even in the pure case where you're not giving it any rules per se, in, th- in this sense, in other words, you would give it guidelines like, I assume you would say, don't bother to look at frequency of letters, but you might look at frequency of words, right? I mean, does that make sense? Like, Yeah, it, it does. And this is one of the very interesting things. I mean, this, this may be like way down in the weeds. Uh, so... The, the type of machine learning that we are talking about right now is called supervised. And it's supervised because you have a human being like doing the labeling, sort of saying something about the e- example data that you're using to, to train. And in most of the classical, uh, supervised learning systems, you were using an algorithm where you had to define what the signal is. And so mm-hmm. like the signal may be like, look at the words or, uh, like uh-huh. look at the bigrams, which are like pairs of words or the trigrams, which mm, are triples mm. of words. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so like you had to not just think about your training data and like the quality of those, uh, training examples that you were having a human being produce, but you were having to think about like, what is, what are the features in the data that I think I'm going to be able to use in my model to be predictive of the thing that I'm trying to predict. Mm-hmm. So that the, what, one of the things that happened around 2012 is we had this revolution called deep learning, uh, where you use these things called deep neural networks that are modeled after biological neural networks in a very loose sort of way. And one of the very special things about deep neural networks and deep learning is you no longer have to think about the signals. Uh, so like you, you just give it the data and like the part of what the DNNs do is like they synthesize effectively what the signals are, uh, that they need to do whatever discrimination you're, uh, or, mm-hmm. or prediction or classification, uh, that you're asking them to do. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that fascinates me about this. And of course, you can do these things in a broad array of contexts. You can, uh, you could, you could, in principle, give a computer, uh, you know, the health records of a whole bunch of people and say, these ones turned out to have cancer. Maybe you can do a better job than we've been doing of predicting that. Uh, you can give them resonant resumes and people you didn't, uh, did and did not hire. What, what, what interests me, among other things, is I've heard that, uh, sometimes like after, you know, the computer does its magic and comes up with a uh, predictive power that's maybe even superior to what humans had. Sometimes you, you can't, it cannot articulate the rule. It's, it's like you still yes. don't know what the criteria it's using are. That kind of amazes me. It's kind of, yeah. it's a little spooky. I mean, there, mu- there has to be a rule implicit or, or a set of rules implicit, right? I mean... It must, it must in some sense be recoverable. It seems to me like what the computer is doing, but I've heard as a practical matter, it's not. You, you, you just, uh, right? Yeah, it, 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 it is. It's, I mean, so the answer to that question is complicated. Um, so it was definitely easier in these classical systems. So pre deep learning to try to figure out exactly why. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why the system is making the decision that it's making. So like, if you think about something simple, like logistic regression, like you have, you've decided what the features are that you're predicting on and what the, the regression gives you as part of a prediction is it tells you 
what the weights are on each one of those features that went into the final score that you get. So like you can look at a score and you say, Oh, like this decided that this thing was bad. Like I'm looking at it and like I've decided that it's good. Mm -hmm. And so you can go in and look at the weights that it assigned to its decision and say, Oh, like I see what's happening. Like we had the wrong training data or like these actually aren't the right features that we should be used for training. Um, with deep neural networks, it gets hard, especially as the networks get big, because you're not, uh, you're not saying what the features are. And so there isn't a human engineered set of features to which the model is assigning right. weight. So when you go back in and try to reverse engineer a decision, it's, it's complicated. Um, and like the bigger the models get, the, like the harder it gets to make sense out of exactly why a thing made a decision. Now that said, like you can sort of look at a, deep neural network the way that you would a natural system, right? So, like, nature hasn't really described the way that, you know, proteins work in in cells or, you know, like, the way that, you know, quantum mechanics uh, interacts with gravity, right? But you can run experiments to try to understand what's going on. You can also do that with deep neural networks. So, like, you can sort of treat them like a, you know, a phenomenon that you're trying to understand with carefully controlled experiments. Uh, and like, that's mm -hmm. a lot of the way that we debug how they're working. Uh, because, you know, like you said, even when they get to the point of superhuman performance on a particular task, like a narrow task, uh, and that, that's all we're talking about here. Like we have not yet got to the point where we can build systems that are holistically equivalent to humans. Like they, yeah, you know, when we say something has superhuman performance, it's usually on something very narrow, like uh, figuring out what the antecedent is to a pronoun or like assigning a, a label to the content in an image. Um, um, but, you know, like if you, it, you there are ways that you can try to understand why the things are making the decisions that they're mm -hmm. making. And then you go in and you sort of change your training data to try to get the model to perform better. Okay. So we, we've been talking about a, a kind of what's called machine learning, I gather, partly because uh, that seems to be the thing these days. People talk about it a lot. But, um, but, but there are a lot of things you would apply the term AI to, right? Um, generating speech from text, uh, uh, well, the semantic processing of text, and and maybe yep. some of this, uh, and I, I assume some of this probably does involve machine learning, but you know, uh, playing playing chess, and and so on. Um, are there? Uh, I gather that I, I think originally there was a school of thought that the way to get computers to do things humans do would be to emulate the processes that are at work in the humans, right? And and I gather that really doesn't happen much, right? I mean, I mean the way the way Deep Blue or whatever that computer was called plays chess is not no. is not the way Bobby Fischer played chess, no. it, not the way it, it conceives of it. It, it. There's a lot more brute force and and so on. Um, well, it, although you know, it's sort of I, I'm not a I'm not a chess player, so I you know I can't tell you like what thought process Magnus Carlsen has when he's evaluating a move. But, you know, like it, it, it seems unlikely that the computer is doing, uh, you know, doing a, the exact thing that right. a biological brain is doing uh, when it's evaluating, you know, the next move that it should make. Yeah. Um, and, and in general, most times I gather in these realms, um, I mean, most of the AI, AI you're familiar with, it's not, it's it, it's it's not emulating, uh, and that's not the way they even try to do it. They just try to get the job done. I mean, the engineers who design the AI systems, they don't really care by and large whether it's doing it the way the human would do it, and and often it's not. Well, I I think the thing that we we try to do, I mean, like there 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 are several things at play. So th there is still a lot that I think we can learn from uh, human brains. Um, mm -hmm which are just remarkably powerful instruments and they do what they do in a dramatically more efficient way than these machine learning systems. I mean, so mm -hmm. right now, like we, you know, we're having this conversation and, you know, like we have a, 
like a high level sort of cognitive framework for, you know, the, this, this discussion that we're having. And like, we're doing that with, you know, less than a hundred Watts of power inside of each of our heads <laughs> being consumed. Speak uh, for yourself. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, when you, when you think about like, what a modern machine learning system does to solve one of these narrow tasks. Uh, like it is consuming a lot more power and the training of the models consumes, uh, like, you know, substantial amounts of power relative to what a human being does. So, you know, mm -hmm. like I, 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 I think I had the anecdote in the book about the, yeah, you know, the, the difference in the amount of energy or the amount of computation that went into, uh, AlphaGo Zero, which is, uh, a, uh, like a self-supervised system that learned how to beat human grandmasters at the game of Go mm -hmm. versus Lisa Dahl, who, uh, like was the grandmaster that this system ultimately <laughs> beat. Like his learning efficiency, like becoming a Go master was very, very, very much higher than that machine learning system. Like, you know, it took yeah. millions of rounds of self-play for, the machine learning system to figure out like how to be a grandmaster. It did not take millions of games right. of go for, uh, for Lee, uh, Lisa at all to learn how to be a grandmaster. Right. Okay. I, that's kind of reassuring, I guess. Although, <laughs> <laughs> although there's, there's uh computers do have plenty of power to, to bring to bear. So uh, the fact that they require a lot, uh, it probably won't be much of a handicap for them. The, um, Okay, so let's let's talk a little about um, kind of the economic implications of these things, um, and there, there's a number of different contexts that you address in the book. Um, you know, farming, manufacturing. Uh, I, I guess the the standard concern is that you know, if if machines can do the job that a person was doing. And it's cheaper to have the machine do it uh, than to have the person do it. Uh, so much that's bad news for the person. Uh, any, you know, any, any company, uh, that's trying to maximize profits will do it the cheapest way it can. Uh, and, um, so what's your, what's your response to that kind of base level concern? Well, I think it's, it's something that we have to think about because if you look at, the history of any technological disruption, like there is this pattern that plays out. Like you invent a thing that does something that, you know, humans were doing before unassisted or, um, yeah, or, or with, you know, less good assistant than the new technological instrument that you've built. Uh, you know, the nature of their jobs change and sometimes like they change in a way that, uh, like folks don't like and that they're not prepared for and that has, you know, some pretty negative consequences. Um, the, the anecdote that I love is, uh, you know, that I refer back to a bunch is what happened, uh, in the early days of the industrial revolution where, you know, we invented steam engines and used them as the means of production in factories, uh, where the means mm -hmm. of production had been human manual labor before. Um, and yeah, the, the thing that happened in the early days of the industrial revolution is you had these much more efficient factories that could scale out. And so consumers benefited, like they got you know, better and more and cheaper products. Uh, but, uh, the nature of labor changed in a way that, uh, like was very disruptive. And most of the benefits of this accrued to, you know, the public, uh, with these products, but like in particular to capital holders. So like if you had enough money to go build one of these, uh, factories, uh, oriented around, uh, a steam engine, like you, you could get a pretty good return on that capital investment. And if you were an expert, uh, someone who could design and maintain these machines, like you could also earn a, a pretty good living. Um, and you know, eventually like it, it things smoothed out. Like you don't have monopolies now that are, you know, have their, you know, monopoly power because, uh, you know, like they, they, you know, they make engines, uh, like engines are sort of a ubiquitous building block of the modern world. Like you've got them in watches, like, you know, you've got, got, got them in cars, you have them. I mean, air, in air electric power plants, they're everywhere. And so, you know, the, 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 the thing that I think a lot about is like, 
you know, if AI is a thing that's sort of like the the steam engine and that it's going to really dramatically change the means of production for a bunch of things that human beings are doing right now, like what does that look like? And like, what, how long is this period of disruption and how can you manage the period so that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like has, uh, strong positive benefits versus, uh, strong negative, uh, consequences for people. Um, right. and, and it, look, I think there are a bunch of ways that you can think about, uh, uh, think about how we roll this technology out that are, uh, strongly beneficial to people. Uh, like we have choices that we can make right now that will impact things. I, d- mm-hmm. I don't think anything is on some sort of predetermined, uh, like runaway trajectory where we don't get to decide as a society what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess the, uh, I mean, the good news is, you know, when, when machines increase productivity, uh, that means, uh, in principle, we can produce, uh, more stuff per human being, uh, more, you know, including stuff they really like, like food and, uh, and shelter and, um, and smartphones and everything. Uh, I guess the concern is that, and you know, historically, in the long run, we, we always have managed to find a place for people to be working that has resulted in a change in the composition of work it wasn't all that long ago i don't know when it was but that you know most of the workforce was uh involved in agriculture i mean at some point in the history of our republic that was the case uh there was a movement toward uh you know into into kind of manufacturing and then as a result of uh partly the information age you know move move into you know, more services and information handling sectors and so on. I guess the concern is that, like, as you keep, you know, at some point, it's like, uh, right? I mean, I mean, well, let me put it to you this way. There, there are people who think that the challenge is going to be, like, basically everything um, is just going to be occupying human beings. Like, like... Yes, we will be so productive as a species that there will be enough stuff for everyone. It's a question of what, how they, how they while away the hours, right? Uh, I mean, in other words, there, there are people who imagine a world in which there just basically aren't jobs and you're going to have to give people hobbies. Now, granted, they're, they're probably thinking a very long way off. Uh, but in any event, that, that concern does not loom large for you, right? Well, it, it's, like that is not a vision of the world that excites me. I guess I should. <laughs> uh, I should the say. The Wally. Like, have you seen the movie Wally? The, I, the, uh, I have. Yeah, the uh, Wally. The Wally scenario isn't appealing to you. So, sitting in no. a lounge chair with a supersized uh, beverage. Yeah, I I I like to be busy. Uh, like I, you know, I I don't know about you. I've 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 always. The, the problem I have is sort of exactly the opposite. I have more things that I want to do than I have time. Um, and like, I'm constantly looking for ways to try to be more productive at the things that I'm doing so that I can do more, more of those things. Um, and, and, you know, by productive, I don't mean, you know, like in terms of economic output, uh, like some of the things that I do are creative. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so I, I think people are, very, very clever and very industrious by, by and large. And I, I, you know, one of the points that I was trying to make in the book is that, you know, if you go to, you know, you go to Campbell County, Virginia today and you look at the entrepreneurs who are successful, like they are employing technology in sophisticated ways. And, uh, you know, you sort of give them powerful tools and they go do super creative things uh with them that maybe you or and I couldn't plan out in advance. Uh like I, I think the sum total of our creativity and our industry is uh is like bigger than what we imagine. Um mm-hmm. and and you know like we've got a I think some of the some of the stuff with AI is like we we get confused uh maybe a little bit by this whole notion of intelligence, which we really ill understand ourself. Um, you know, like it's, it, we, we have lots and lots of disagreements about what constitutes human intelligence and like how to measure it. And, um, 
you know, one of the funny things with AI is that like we are constantly moving the the goalposts for like what an intelligent system is. Uh, so you, you mentioned you know Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov at chess, uh, mm-hmm. like in the nine late nineties. Uh, like we we used to believe before then that if you had a software system that could play chess as well or better than a human grandmaster that like wow that's a high water mark of cognition like you know we're sort of there and like as soon as it happened we're like well you know maybe <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe we're still pretty far away um mm-hmm. and so like if you think about ai as like an augmentative uh thing um you know that we're going to be able to put into the hands of lots of people and then they're going to figure out creative interesting uses for it like i think we get to a very interesting world and we we certainly have enough problems looming ahead of us where if you don't have some sort of powerful technological thing intervening we're going to be in trouble Mm -hmm. uh and and so like i'm i'm hoping that we can figure out how to how to get this these ai technologies deployed because those problems are big and and we we need all the all the tools we we can get in our arsenal to go solve those problems. Okay, well, one thing you say in the book is that AI can be a, a tool for turning zero sum games into non zero sum games. Yes, and 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 that technology more broadly can be or has been. What do you what do you mean by that? And and what are what's an example of the way you, uh, either you've seen this happen or you'd like to see it happen with AI? Yeah, so I. Um you know, and, and like, I, I should start by saying that, um, your book, uh, which I read, uh, I can't remember whether I was still in graduate school or I had just, uh, you know, just graduated was like one of the most influential things I've ever read. Uh, which I, I wasn't like, actually fishing for a plug with that question, but uh, if you must, uh, yeah, no, you, you, look, you, you should, you should take the compliment. Uh, like I, it, it, it was, uh, I think a very, very, uh, influential. Very influential book. And so, you know, I, and since then, like, I've been looking at the world through these, you know, this pattern of, you know, like, where, what are the zero sum games and like, how can we pivot and transform them into non zero sum ones? Because, uh, you know, like creating abundance where none existed before, uh, like, you know, seems to relieve us of, you know, this, this, uh, you know, thing that we otherwise have to do where we're sort of, you know, fighting over scarcity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so like the, the thing that AI, I think does is it creates, uh, it, it creates a non-zero sum game around cognition. Uh, you know, and so like you may not think that we, you know, we're cognition, uh, bound it right now with eight billion human beings with perfectly good brains, but I, I think in some cases we actually are. Um, and like I'll give you a, a concrete example. So last year, um, the New York Times published an article uh, talking about the demographic shift in Maine, where, you know, Maine is as like a state in the United States is uh, demographically a little bit older than other states. And so, you know, one of the implications of having a more elderly population is you have fewer people, relatively speaking, in the workforce. And like you've got a larger proportion of people who are in declining health who need to be taken care of um and you know one of the issues in maine is that you know it's not a matter of economics trying to figure out like you know what the wage support level is for getting healthcare workers like there just aren't enough of them and like you know even mm-hmm. if you had infinite amounts of money like you it doesn't seem like you could uh you know, get enough people into in domain hmm. to take care of like all of the all of the elderly that you have, you know, especially in the rural parts of the state. Um you know, I think this is a big concern. Like in, in this this demographic shift is happening everywhere in the Western uh world right now and in, in in China, Japan and Korea as well. So like every industrialized economy has their fertility rates dropping uh you know below repl- replenishment levels, which means you know, like you know, Japan is in the middle of it right now, and uh, you know, like places like Italy are like beginning to see it. Like you can you see some of this playing out even with the uh, with the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, just having having these impacts. But 
um, like part of the thing that we're going to need to figure out how to do is what technological measures are we going to be able to put in place to like allow us to increase productivity in the working age population to backfill for the lost productivity for, you know, retiring folks. And like, how do we support people who are aging in dignity for the entire balance of their life? And like, part of that is, you know, health care and, and elder care, uh, and, you know, like basic things like companionship. Um, and so I, I think you're going to have to have tools like AI to sort out both ends of that problem. So like, you know, doing the productive work, uh, with a shrinking workforce, uh, as well as like, you have to do something about, uh, changing the dynamic on healthcare right now where like our healthcare costs are growing faster than GDP, uh, which is not sustainable when you have a, uh, when you have a population of people who are going to need more health care over time. And so AI can help what? In the diagnostic realm, for one thing? Well, um, that, that's, that's the thing that's happening right now. You, you mentioned, you know, you alluded to one of the, one of the things. So like we, you know, with medical imaging and like reading EKGs and charts and whatnot, like we already have. Uh, AI systems that on paper, like they haven't been widely deployed yet, but on paper can, you know, read a EKG better than a cardiologist that can, uh, you know, sort of look through like very noisy, uh, imaging data and sort of spot things that, uh, like an oncologist needs to go in and take a second look at. And, you know, when you look at those things, it's not about like, oh, the oncologist or the cardiologist are going to lose their job. It just means that you are, you're doing two things. You are helping them, uh, you know, you're, you're giving them a tool so that they are spending less of their time on the most tedious part of their job, uh, and where they can spend more of their time thinking about, you know, their patients and therapies and like how to get them healthy. And it also gives you the opportunity to like put these diagnostic technologies in places where you just wouldn't have them before. Like, you know, the healthcare system right now mm -hmm. can't afford for you and I to have a cardiologist, uh, look at our, uh, look at our EKGs, uh, at every one of our checkups, uh, right? Like there just aren't enough cardiologists in the world right now to do that. Like we could benefit mm -hmm. for sure from like having uh, you know, like a, a AI cardiologist looking at our chart, uh, and seeing if we need to be referred to a, uh, to a human cardiologist if something looks funny. And, and better yet, like, you know, they're, the, the, the day is coming where you and I will be wearing, uh, like very sophisticated sensor packages on our body, like whether it's in your smartwatch or a fitness band or, or something entirely else. Like there's a company called Aura that makes rings that, uh, you know, look at your, uh, biometric data, uh, like in real time. And like those data streams are going to be able to, you know, help us diagnose things very, very early on, uh, you know, when things are easier to treat where like, you know, maybe you can, you can sort of stave off serious illness by just changing your patterns of behavior. Um, and so mm -hmm. like that, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, like what, what, one of the things that I've seen over the past year with COVID where, you know, we, we've spent a ton of time with partners and, you know, we have a pretty substantial uh, synthetic biology team, uh, inside of Microsoft research and, um, yeah, you know, like one of the things that's happening is AI is being used more and more in, uh, drug discovery. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, you know, when you look at trying to find a therapeutic for something like COVID-19, uh, like you're, you're trying to understand something about, you know, the SARS coronavirus 2 receptor binding domain, like this little spike protein and a bunch of, molecules around it like how it's interacting with things inside of the human proteome and like you you do a bunch of these simulations using techniques called molecular dynamics which are really i don't, I don't want to call them simple computations but they're they're sort of straightforward sorts of simulations that just need a lot of compute and like there are a lot of ways that you can accelerate those sorts of computations with machine learning techniques uh because you know, in some ways, like machine learning is able to understand things about the these very complicated interactions in molecular systems that you can't describe as uh, concisely with mathematics. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, uh, I mean, you certainly acknowledge that in, uh, sometimes, you know, workers will be displaced by advances in AI. You know, as we've said, historically, uh, when workers are displaced by automation, new jobs are created somewhere in the economy. Um, uh, and, and so in the long run, it's not a problem. You'd like it to not be a problem even in the short run. And, and, and one thing you do is encourage companies who, who, that realize economies by replacing workers with automation in some sense, uh, to look for ways they could use those workers more productively and maybe in the process give them more fulfilling work even, um, rather than fire them. Is yeah. that, uh, I mean, I would think that's kind of a tough sell with companies, right? I mean, I mean, they, they have their ideas about what, what thing is most, what, what things are most conducive to profit, right? And, uh, and they, they probably often don't want to hear a sermon about their moral responsibility to their workers. I guess your view is it's not just a moral argument. No, no, no. I look, I, I don't think it's just a moral argument at all. Although moral arguments are important. Uh, you know, like I think all of us who are, running businesses uh, like have to realize that those businesses operate in the context of communities. And so we have a responsibility to the communities that we operate in and, and to the economies that support us. Like we can't just be entirely focused on the short term and, and, and not think about the long term. It's just, you know, sort of craziness uh, thinking that way. But, but even, even if you like do, uh, you know, find yourself in a mode where you're thinking very much about the short term, uh, and like you don't want to think about the morality of, uh, you know, like what the decisions that you're making, you know, sort of dangerous. Like I, I think it is, um, net better for your business when you are thinking about how to leverage the creativity in the industry of the people, of those human beings who work for you. Um, you know, I, I, I know in my own work life, um, you know, and like this is part, partly just being an engineer. Like every time I've tried to automate away something, I'm automating away a thing that is tedious and repetitive and driving me crazy. Uh, that like I, that is taking time away from me doing something that, uh, like I will both enjoy more and that will produce more value. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, <laughs> there, there's a very uh, famous uh, computer programming language designer named Larry Wall who like uh, like wrote about this uh, in terms of language design as uh, like this uh, this like the laziness of engineers is a virtue. Uh, you know, so I <laughs> I I do actually believe that. And, and like we see this anecdotally all the time with, uh, with, with customers, like those customers who are able to like uplift their human assets by automating away a bunch of the low value stuff that they're doing. You know, like you think I, I gave a customer support scenario, uh, which is a real one. I can't name the, name the company, but if I said their name, like we would all recognize them. And like, you know, the thing that they did is they said, okay. We realize that we have a customer support operation um, where we don't know without some sort of technological intervention how to spend more dollars on customer support in a way that will produce more customer satisfaction. Like they just reached a saturation point. Um, hmm. And when they deployed AI, like what they did is they said, okay, like I'm going to use a bunch of machine learning systems, some agents to – do the first level customer support. So the traffic directing, the answering the obvious questions. Uh, and like the objective is it, it for these agents is going to be to get someone exactly the answer to their question or directing them to a human being as quickly as possible who can, you know, engage with them in the deep problem solving that the computers are not good at. And when they did this, like they made their customer support agents so much more productive. Uh, in the sense of, you know, like a dollar spent on customer support producing, uh, like more positive customer satisfaction, mm -hmm. uh, that they actually increase the size of their, uh, mm. or the number of their customer mm. support mm. agents. And they could only do that because, like, they had a tool that made them more productive. 
Um, and, and like, you know, the side effect of this is that the customer support agents were happier because like they got to do the thing that they were uniquely good at, you know, having, you know, compassion for a customer, like engaging, you know, with them in problem solving, uh, you know, like forming a connection between two human beings. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that machines get to the point where they do that at all. No, although we are approaching the point, presumably, where it will be possible for me to literally not know as a customer if they want to conceal it from me, whether I'm dealing with a machine or not, right? I mean, I, you know, we probably tend to overestimate how soon that will happen, but do you yeah. doubt that it will happen? I mean, we're in a way, we're talking about the Turing test. I mean, do, do, do you doubt that uh, if you give them 10, 20 years it, 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 it will it will take a customer a long time to figure out that that's not a human being. Yeah, I, look, I think you're probably already at the point if the interaction is simple enough, uh, uh -huh. you probably, you know, you can, you'd have a hard time knowing now. Um, and so it just it, it's it's a it's a spectrum. Uh, like I think the harder the the problems are that you're trying to debug in a customer support, uh, you know, interaction. Uh, and like part of the problem is like you're, you're trying to resolve the customer's problem and to make them satisfied. Uh, right. and so like, and, which is different than like training, uh, like an agent to answer a question accurately and or, so or make like, a reservation at a restaurant. Google demonstrated some, some impressive. Yeah software for that for make for being the person who answers and says yes i'll help you make a reservation you 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 could go through that whole process without knowing it's a machine but yeah you're talking here about yeah. something at a higher and order then, of and and like some of this is just going to be preference of like what do we want to do here like do you want to do you want to talk to a machine or a human being uh like is uh, i don't know i mean uh uh, I'm not sure they're going to ask me. I mean, you know, it just seems like economic efficiency can wind up being a very powerful argument uh, one way or another. But but yeah. look, I agree. I, I mean, you know, I remember the days when you would like uh, you would like have pleasant conversations with tech support people. Right. I want I, I this is, has nothing to do with this, but this was in such early days. uh this was just a program for converting a word processing, uh, a word document into a, a document that uh, a word processing program called Xyrite could read. And I called tech support. And at some point I realized I was talking to the guy who wrote the software. You know, yep. he was, he was the tech support guy. But even, even between then and now, there was a phase where, I don't know, you would, uh, you could wind up just having a, an interesting conversation with a tech support person. They weren't, they weren't just like reading from this thing that that told them uh, how to move you on to the next uh, yeah. phase of anxiety reduction. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, the, the the thing that I think we could get to with some of this stuff, like even, even if you're just sort of, sort of thinking about the narrow domain of customer support, is you really could use this technology to fundamentally rethink the way the role that customer support plays in the life of the customer and in the functioning of the organization. Like imagine, imagine, you know, like the charter for a customer support agent. And I think Zappos uh, is, is a good example that like, you know, this was really the charter of their customer support. Like their job was to, delight the person that called in for customer support even if it meant directing them to like some competitors uh hmm. like hmm. set of products mm -hmm. um you know and just imagine like taking that further where you know like maybe you need to like have these human beings with decision making power who can relax you know some of the constraints of the organization my my mom and brother the other day like had a problem with their internet line and they called up uh customer support all of which was human um, and in fixing their problem, like they introduced, uh, another one, like they evidently had had more upload bandwidth than they were allowed to have. And like when they fixed mm -hmm. the problem, they lowered the, you know, their upload bandwidth, uh, down. And then there was no way mm -hmm. that any of the human beings in this customer support organization could restore the amount of bandwidth that they had before they flipped right. the switch. And it was because everything was sort of too rigid. 
but like imagine if you could you know optimize away like some of the you know basic parts of that customer support job and then like hire customer support people who like actually could make decisions about business policy uh you know to delight customers and to make sure that you're like i i I don't know. Like, I, I think sometimes, mm-hmm. like, we think about these things in too narrow a way. Like, we sort of look at them, you know, in terms of like these very, very short term economic optimizations or, or short term economic anxieties on the other end of things rather than sort of saying like, all right, we have this thing. Like, what could we really, really do with it? That's, that's just transformative and in, in the most positive sense. Mm hmm. So, um, we, I think we, I think we have kind of a sense for your overall philosophy that in the long run, new jobs tend to be created. You, you, you invoke at one point, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and say that, you know, look, you know, if you start out at the, at the bottom of the pyramid with just providing food and shelter and, and, and physical health and, and then you work your way up all the way to self-actualization, you know, it may not be, uh, Bad news if, if, if machines are capable of, of taking care of, uh, do, improve our ability to meet the needs at the lower level and in the process, uh, liberate us to, to, to find fulfillment at the higher levels. You're, you believe that, uh, those things can happen, that, that, uh, uh, and we've talked about one way you hope it'll happen is that, you know, companies will act wisely. Uh, try to, try to think of new ways to use their human resources, uh, before deciding to dispose of them. But there's also a role for, uh, public policy here. And you spend a certain for amount sure. of time in that in the book. And I don't, I don't want to, um, end the conversation without giving you a chance to talk about that. Well, I, I do think that public policy is super important. And like we can think of, I mean, like, you know, from a policy perspective, you have carrots and sticks, right? Like, you can set policy that incents, uh, you know, companies and individuals to do things that are, you know, over whatever time horizon you choose, uh, good for the, you know, the public whole. Um, and you can set disincentives, uh, in policy as well. So one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, if you really wanted to, uh, create some incentives to get the development of AI aligned with, uh, like the, the public good. You could do something like the Apollo program, uh, like pick a, pick a big problem, climate change, uh, like feeding the three billion net new humans that will get added to the population before the end of this century, uh, figuring out how to handle this demographic inversion, figuring out how to, solve this you know this thing in the united states at least we think is intractable which is you know how do you get ubiquitous high quality cheap health care uh you know in the hands of the public like all of those are problems that you could use ai to make progress towards and i i think that for a very small amount of our national wealth, you could create a set of incentives to encourage people to like, not just develop the technology, but to apply it to like one of these things. Like in a sense, like it could be even better than the Apollo program because yeah, the Apollo program involved a moonshot, which was like, you know, that rallying uh, call, but like the moonshot itself was arbitrary. We didn't need to go to the moon. Mm -hmm. Like there was, you know, nothing there other than, you know, our desire to explore a new frontier. Uh, like here we could pick something that would legitimately transform the public good. Um, hmm. you know, and, and then there's the flip side. There's the, you know, the disincentives. There could be, you know, tax policy that, uh, you know, you put in place to ensure that companies are very much encouraged to think about, uh, like how to, uh, retrain and, to, uh, like imagine those beneficial use cases for their employees. And, you know, like if they're not doing that and doing it well, then like maybe there's a cost associated with that. So I think these are certainly the things that we ought to be debating because, um, the faster that we can get to a equilibrium where this technology gets built and put into the hands of as many people as humanly possible, uh, you know, we're going to see the, you know, the benefits. So mm-hmm. like the things that are standing in the way of us getting the equilibrium are just, I mean, like in my, my 
in my mind, like wasted energy or wasted opportunity. Okay. And I guess it goes without saying that you're something of a STEM advocate in when it comes to education policy, right? I, I am, but like I'm also a big, big believer in uh, like the liberal arts. Uh, you know, well, yeah. Enough. In fact, you thought about getting your PhD in literature, didn't you? I mean, as I, an I undergraduate, you were still considering that, even though you had become completely enamored of computers. Yeah, I, I absolutely was, uh, and I mean, I, I think I made the right decision, but I. Um, I still wonder what my life would have been like with, uh, you know, with a literature PhD. I love language. I love reading. I love, uh, I love the act of writing. Um, what, what kind of know, literature? I, do, well, go ahead. Well, and, uh, I, so I, I, I think that the liberal arts in general, um, and, and literature, like in particular, like teaches us something about human nature. Um, I mean, like, I, I, you know, I, I know people like try to make the distinction, you know, between like, you know, literature is fiction and nonfiction is a different thing. But like, you know, I even look at your book, like it, it, I read it at this formative time in my life where I had this, um, I only had an intuitive sense of like, here, here's what I think is important. And, you know, here's what is interesting and here's what's fulfilling and, you know, like I, I was directionally, you know, moving, uh, you know, moving, I, I think in an okay, uh, okay direction, but like I didn't have a framework, uh, or like I hadn't built a framework in my head of like, you know, sort of how to think about, yeah, you know, producing, um, you know, producing good. Um, hmm. you know, and like I think this notion of, you know, non zero sum games is like a, is a powerful framework. It's not the only framework, but like, you know, I think this is the, this is the thing that, um, you know, the social sciences and, and the liberal arts and, you know, this whole multidisciplinary bag of things like, you know, really teaches us something about our own humanity, about our thought processes, how we interact with other people, like how we mm -hmm. have stable social equilibria. Um, and like, it's, I think it's more important now than ever. Like the STEM stuff's important because technically there's a bunch of stuff we need to go do, but. Like we need to like be thinking about our humanity now more than we ever have been before, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's just you know like whether it's reading a Jonathan Franzen book or you know uh, which you know tells you something about being an adult human being in like early new millennium, um, you know, or it's you know a a book like yours, uh, like I think just wallowing in the thoughts of your fellow human beings is like a super important thing. And again, you, like that's something that that, 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 that a machine's not going to do for you. Do you have a sense for what kind of, uh, what, what literature you would have specialized in had you become, uh, like an academic in that realm or something? I mean, you know. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a big, big fan of, uh, uh, late, uh, late 19th century sort of post Victorian, uh, mm. English literature and like stuff, um, stuff from the early, uh, early half of the 20th century. Yeah. And like, there's just a, yeah, this is incredible diversity of writers, uh, like producing, you know, beautiful work, uh, that I, I still ad admire a lot. Um, you know, like Paul Bowles, uh, sheltering sky and Athel Frugard and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, uh, like, I remember reading these works, uh, yeah, and then like they partly resonated with me because like I was uh like they were all works about uh culture and uh you know like foreignness and uh you know like being displaced from home. Um and like you know, it was at this point in my life where I was wandering around trying to figure out what home actually was. Hmm. Uh and so like it was just like this incredibly powerful stuff to like know that you're not alone, uh, in the world and, uh, like what you're going through, other people have gone through and they've dealt with in this incredible diversity of ways. And, you know, like you can benefit from that. Um, I don't know. It's, I'm, I, I, I love, I love literature. And, and look, I, I think, <laughs> you know, in a world where, 
you know, like one of the things I know for sure is that, uh, like we will have, we, we already have machine learning systems, uh, that are like fully capable of getting a perfect score on a GRE or an SAT test or like, you know, sort of pick your standardized, like mechanistic thing. And if like we think that that is the objective of, of education is like teaching, uh, you know, teaching students how to robotically respond to a set of test questions. Uh, like we're basically setting them up, uh, for, yeah, you know, these competitions with software that like they are not going to want to be in. Um, mm-hmm. and like I, I do think we've got a lot of thinking that we have to do about the nature of modern education, which is more or less, uh, a byproduct of the needs of the industrial revolution, like where you need, uh, you need a literate, educated public to go do the sorts of jobs that were available then. Like we, it's time to rethink everything, I think. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, this has uh, been a great conversation. Uh, I, I guess I have to ask you one more question. You can just answer yes, yes or no. I know you've got to go. We, I've, uh, I've, I've pushed past what was your, your, uh, your, your, uh, you're you're kind of hard out, uh, but um, should we or should we not worry about being subjugated by our robot overlords? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, like <laughs> okay. we, we 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 what we should worry about is like how can we ensure that human beings using uh, like very powerful technological tools are like using them in ways that are not oppressive. Mm-hmm. Like that is, that's a, like, I'm not worried about like the, you know, the, the Terminator scenario where like we build a thing that, you know, becomes self-aware and then decides that, you know, like we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're the enemy. Uh, mm-hmm. like I, I worry about what humans do with, with tools that other humans have made. That makes sense to me. That, that does seem to be the fundamental lesson of history. Um, Okay, well, thanks so much, Kevin. Again, the name of the book is Reprogramming the American Dream from Rural America to Silicon Valley, Making AI Service All Know. Is there some place people, oh, you've got a podcast people should know about. Uh, behind, is it Behind the Tech? Behind uh, the Tech with Kevin Scott. Okay, anything else you want to plug? Yeah, I, I, uh, so thank you very, very much for, uh, for having me on your podcast. Uh, and like, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I guess if anything, you know, there's the book and there's my podcast. Uh, check them out if you, uh, you know, if you feel so inclined. Okay, I, I encourage that as well. It's, it's a it's a very interesting story you have to tell, partly by virtue of your own uh, your own origins, which we didn't have time to get into as as much as I would have liked. It's a it's a fascinating part of the book. Thank so you. thank you, and uh, and I and I'll get back to you later about the tech support. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Happy All to right. help in any way I can. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Kevin.